are. She sent the monitors off. We're going to start with These Are the Days of Elijah. You may be seated if you'd like. There's all kinds of blessings that he brings to our lives, things that he does that sometimes we don't even recognize, but he's healed my body, he's, I don't know the rest of the words, <laughs> he's touched my mind, and he saved me just in time. Look what the Lord has done.
Hallelujah. Amen. He's a great God today. Thank God for his presence that's here. Amen. You can be seated at this time. I know all of you are thinking at this point, are those for me, Pastor? Well, give me a few minutes and you'll find out. Amen. But it is great to be together in God's house once again, and I'm thankful for his presence that I feel here already. Amen. And there's always lots that's going on in our world and in people's lives, but I'm thankful that we have a God who doesn't change. Yesterday, today, forever, he stays the same. He stays faithful. Amen. And so I'm glad to see some of you that are feeling better and able to be here today. And then there's others that are sick and not able to be here today, but Throughout it all, we have a God that we can rely on and who takes care of us. Amen. I just want to give you some announcements. Uh, tonight, our uh, regular service will be taking place at 6.30. Amen. And I have an opportunity to minister to you here tonight. And I, I have a word, I believe, that's really going to, I pray, speak to people tonight. And so I'll see you tonight at 6.30. Tuesday night is our small groups, our light groups. And this is week five of six with those. And Looking forward to being together for our small groups once again. And coming up, we have got the Pentecostals of Renfrew on December the 1st. December the 8th is our Christmas concert. Now, it's hard to believe that that's only, at this point, uh, three or four weeks away, but time is moving quickly. And so remember also, those of you that are part of our drama, that uh, our practice will be on Tuesday night after our small groups. Kind of ironic for those of you that are part of our drama, for our, our lead actor there. I got a, a, a message from him this morning right before service. Won't be there this morning. The neighbor's cows are on the road trying to help herd them into the fields. And so Farmer Grumble is at it again. So anyway, at least he's being helpful this time. But anyway, you'll have to be here for that Christmas concert and start inviting people out. It's going to be awesome. We're going to have a great time once again. And I'm just kind of give, going to give you a quick overview of this today, but we will start to be promoting our Christmas for Christ offering that we do every year in terms of giving towards North American missions, founding and establishing of new churches, getting the gospel into new places, and all across the province of Ontario, we are so blessed that Christmas for Christ funds are helping churches be started and established. It's a great thing to be a part of. And so just be kind of planning ahead. Our goal, as always, is to give our best gift, our best gift to Jesus on his birthday. Amen. Those of you that expressed a desire to be a part of the tech and video team, we have a plan moving ahead for that. And so um, after service today, just for a couple of minutes, those of you that are here, just I'm going to have you connect with, uh, with Pastor Craig and with Brother Ryan there at the booth, just to uh, just kind of give you the plan of what's happening moving ahead and then and the orientation will take place. And so anyway, you can connect with them after service here this morning and we'll get moving ahead with all of that. So this week, um, we are going to, in a moment, celebrate the birthdays that are upcoming, but we do want to take a moment right now, and we want to celebrate a very important birthday that happened this week, and that is for Sister Macy. Sister Macy, that's right. All of you wondered, was it for me? Sister Macy wondered, was it for me? Yes, it was for her, and so I'm going to ask her to come, and this is a surprisingly heavy Every time I go to pick it up, I, I just, I'm a little surprised by how much it weighs. But we are so thankful for uh, Sister Macy and all that she does for the church and uh, for keeping uh, Pastor Craig sane and reasonably happy. And so we, we appreciate all that because I know that's a big job right there. But uh, anyway, I'm so thankful that God led her here. And wouldn't you like to hear her say just a couple of words to you here this morning? Yeah, that's right. Wow, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well, <laughs> I feel like I just got up here and, and thanked everybody. All, everything's all in a row. <laughs> but I am, I'm always thankful. I think about it, I think, every single day that we're here and that this is the church that we're a part of. And I felt like family pretty much immediately, and that's a, that's a very special thing. So I'm still in my 20s. I still have one more year. <laughs> Not that I'm afraid of being 30, but... Yeah, I'm just very thankful for everybody, every single person that's here and that has loved on me and that will love on this little baby boy that's yes. coming. <laughs> yes. 
Sister Abin and I have worked hard at making her feel like family because we immediately started teasing her and making up names for her and all of those things just to make her feel loved, you know, all that special stuff. So, so we just uh, we celebrated Sister Macy's birthday. And so upcoming for this week, here are the birthdays we have to celebrate. We have Garth. We're celebrating this week. We've got Nikki Graham. We have got Craig Christofferson has a birthday this week. So how about that? Amen. And Kendra Anderson, who's not here because she's pushing cows as well. Uh, but we want to sing for all of these here today. Amen. A happy birthday to you. A happy birthday to you. May you feel Jesus near every day of the year. A happy birthday to you. A happy birthday. And the best year you've ever had. Amen. Let's give them a hand. Amen. Well, one other before I get out of the way, one other answered prayer this morning. We're praying for a number of people that have been talking to me about they're trying to get time off uh, from their boss to come to church. One of those on the list was Isaac. Isaac's here this morning, so thank the Lord for that. I, I say that. There he is right there. Look at his timing is off by like three seconds, but amen. Thank God for, uh, for answering that prayer, and we do want to pray for all of these because it's important to be together. Amen. And we're going to worship him together and give right now. God bless you. We're going to sing It's All in Him. Stop the goddamn. 
Jesus. Amen. Amen. You can be seated here this morning. Amen. Sunday school kids, you can head on down today. Amen. And this morning is a, a little bit of a special service. I haven't necessarily been promoting it, but going back to our planning session in the spring, we talked about this particular day as a day when uh, we're going to have a kind of a focus on missions and the purpose of missions around the world. And uh, we actually have, some of you know, not all of you know, however, we have the privilege of having a former missionary on our team here. And uh, Pastor Craig Christofferson was a missionary to the country of Sweden for several years. And so I think he is a perfect person to kind of share what it looks like on the other side of the missions paradigm and why it is so important that we as the church are invested in missions and giving towards, praying towards the work of God and the spreading of the gospel around the world. I had an opportunity because of Sister Sean being here for our ladies' dinner, which, by the way, thank you to uh, Sister Helen and her team, Sister Abbott, for their work with that. And I heard great things about what Sister Sean had to share with our ladies but in talking to her, she, she and I were talking about some of the, the current world events and how that she says, and I agree, that we have a, a little bit of a pre, reprieve here, a little narrow window in which the gospel is a chance to be, to be preached around the world and then the end comes. And, and we are in that, that last window and it is so vitally important that we have a missions mindset of getting the gospel not just to our community and we need to do that more and more effectively but also in getting the gospel to the world. So Pastor Craig if you would come and bring us the word today. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Well we're going to go and we're going to open up here. We're going to take a look at our first scripture and get started. It's going to be a bit of a different um, service, not necessarily your typical Sunday morning preaching, but uh, hopefully it'll be both informative and, and I'll share some stuff that, that missionaries, missionaries deal with that maybe uh, you might not think about or maybe missionaries maybe don't exactly like to talk about, but let's get started here. Mark chapter 16, verses 14 to 15. It says, later he, this is Jesus, appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table and he rebuked their unbelief and their hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him before he had risen. And Jesus said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, to everyone. So this morning we're going to be talking about the mission, the mission that God has given us as his disciples, as his church, to go into all the world and to let everybody know the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Let's pray here this morning. Lord, you are wonderful, and I feel your presence in this place, Jesus. I pray that your will would be accomplished and that you would help me, Jesus, to communicate your word in this message here today, Lord. Let us be recipients of it, open-hearted and open-minded, Lord. We want to hear from you. We want you to move in this service, Jesus. Be with us, I pray. Move in a powerful way. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. So Jesus commands his disciples to go into all of the world and spread the gospel, spread the good news, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. No one was to be excluded. No one was to be forgotten. And when we think about it, this charge that Jesus has given to his disciples is an incredibly huge task to go into all of the world. I mean, think about it. Think about who Jesus is speaking to and the time period that he's speaking in. He's speaking to a small group of people whose fastest method of travel is either by horse or by boat. He's speaking in a day when the most common form of travel is walking. And he's telling them, go in to this massive world and tell everybody about me. And I think if he hadn't have ascended into heaven after he told them this, they might have thought Jesus was going a little crazy. Because that's a really big task. And I think that if Jesus had not shown them his nail-scarred hands and the, pierce, the piercing in his side, they would have thought that this task would be impossible. Jesus, how am I supposed to walk the entire length of this planet and tell everyone about you. 
How am I supposed to accomplish this? I don't understand. Taking uh, the gospel of of Jesus Christ out into the world, how on earth do I manage it? Because I don't even have a horse. I don't even have a donkey. You're asking me to walk these places. But this commandment that Jesus was giving them is not, in fact, a new commandment. Uh, uh, Global missions, taking God's message and the gospel of Jesus, this isn't a new idea that Jesus is uh, introducing for the first time here. In fact, taking the uh, message of God out into the world is rooted in the Old Testament. God having relationship with all people has been his heart since the very beginning. If we go back to the Old Testament, we can look at examples there. We can look at examples of, for example, King David. He's bringing the Ark of the Covenant into the tabernacle, and it's a day of rejoicing, and it's a day of celebration. And and 1 Chronicles tells us that uh, King David hands a psalm that he has already written, and he hands it to the priest. And here is what it says, 1 Chronicles 16, 23. Sing to the Lord all the earth. All the earth, everybody in it, proclaim the good news of his salvation day to day. Verse 24, declare his glory among the nations, not just here in Jerusalem, not just here in Israel. Let all of the nations declare his glory. His wonders among just the Jewish people? No, among all people. And so David, inspired by God, he writes, hey, everybody should be a part of this. Everybody should be taken apart, and not only that, but this should be declared in every single nation, in every single country. All people should be taking part of what we are blessed to have here in Jerusalem. And we see God himself declare in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 66, verse 18. He says, it shall be that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they will come and they will see my glory. So from the Old Testament, from the beginning of time, this isn't a, a New Testament invention. This is in global missions. is not North America thinking we're going to go out and save the world. This is God's heart from the beginning of time that he wants every tribe, every tongue, every person, every nation to not just know who he is, but to have a relationship with him and to take part in his salvation plan and this runs again through the new testament we see jesus giving his commandment go into all the world preach the gospel paul writes to timothy he says it's good to pray for the people in authority so that we can live a peaceful and a quiet life and it says first timothy chapter 2 verses 3 and 4 he says that's a good and acceptable prayer in the sight of god our savior and he gives this characteristic to god our savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So God doesn't want just everybody to know about him, but he wants them to be saved, to know the truth. He wants them to take part in uh, what he shed his blood for, what he gave his life for. He wants everybody to have eternal salvation. And so Jesus' command to go into all the world is simply a reiteration of what's been in his heart since the beginning of time. And he tells his disciples, look, you've had the privilege of being with me. And you've had the privilege of feeling how I care for you, how I love you. You've seen my care and my compassion for people. You've seen the power that I have to overcome sickness, to cast out the demons. You've seen all that. But a lot of the world doesn't know about it. And they deserve to. I want them to. I love them, too. It's not just you go into all the world and preach the gospel. And that, as we have already talked about, is not simply uh, a difficult task. That's a really expensive task. Because that means that travel costs need to be covered. You got to pay for a ship to take you there. In our modern uh, times, we got to pay for plane tickets. We've got to pay for housing costs to be covered while we live in that area. We need food costs to be covered. We need uh, rental uh, places, spaces to have meetings to be covered. It, it's an expensive task to go and preach the gospel to the entire world. In our modern day, uh, we have visa applications to enter countries and stay there for a prolonged amount of time. So taking 
God's message to the entire world is more than just a personal commitment. It's an expensive commitment. It comes with a very heavy price tag. Especially when, like I did in my early 20s, whenever you go to a country that is in a housing crisis, that is expensive. And I was doing some research yesterday, and I was in Stockholm, Sweden for, for three years uh, serving uh, the church there, and rental prices have only gone up <laughs> since then. And it was incredibly difficult to get an apartment. You may remember uh, me coming and telling you, saying that whenever parents have children, they sign their children up on the apartment waiting list. So that by the hopes that by their 16th or 18th birthday, it'll be their turn. So Macy and I would be signing up our child in February. <laughs> Boy, I hope by the time they're 16, they got an apartment to rent. It's expensive. And uh, rental prices in Stockholm, I was looking up, I mean, I, I had a deal through, through somebody in the church that the church knew, but rental prices right now are $1,500 a month minimum for a one-bedroom apartment. Those can go up to, to $3,000 a month. So to go to a country and not just stay there for a week, but to stay there is very, very expensive. To reach the whole world with the gospel is an incredibly expensive task, and it is at the heart of God. And, and for those two reasons that God has given us the command to go into the world and do it, and for the other reason being that it is incredibly expensive, this is why it takes a lot of money, and it's why Global Missions is the number one funded ministry within the UPCI. Uh, looking at the 2023 statistics for our organization, looking at the top three ministries that we gave money to as churches within the UPCI, number three, the third highest uh, department that received our monies was the youth department. And as an organization, we gave $8 million to the youth department. And that's incredible. And then for North American missions, reaching cities uh, that do not have churches here in North America, 10 million was given for that purposes. And then for global missions, blowing both of those out of the water, $35.5 million was raised and given to global missions. It takes, amen, it, and every single dollar of that is needed. It takes a lot of money to bring the gospel to the world. And as a church, we support about 35 missionaries every single month to do this task. We support them every single month through a program that is known as Partners in Missions. You might have heard it uh, referenced as PIMs before. It stands for Partners in Missions. And what this program is that um, we have is that PIMs supports missionaries on a monthly basis. And why that is so important is because let's think about kind of our two options. Number one, we can raise a bunch of money and then we send a missionary out on the field for three years, and that's all they have. That's pretty hard to budget out. And when that money runs out, let's say they still have a visa to stay there, they're out of money. They gotta come back. Partners in missions and monthly support is such a beneficial program to a missionary because in an, it essentially acts as a monthly salary for the missionary to cover their cost of travel, of housing, of groceries, of, of the different needs that they need to meet. And having a monthly salary comes in, coming in is so much more beneficial in helping you stay there. Because ultimately, that's what we want. We don't want missionaries coming back and forth, and that means we're, playing for, we're paying for plane tickets back and forth and back and forth because they keep running out of money. We want them to stay there. Uh, and not even just for that sole reason. Think about Who's running the services? When the missionary comes home, who's running the services? We want them to stay in the country. And believe me, as a missionary, you'll want to stay in the country. You absolutely hate leaving. So PIMs is a wonderful program where we are supporting and giving money every single month to a missionary, helping them to stay in the country and to cover their costs. And, you know, there are those who are, are called to, to go 
into other countries and, and be that missionary. And if you are not called to go into that country, if you are not called to go into global missions, that's completely fine. But that doesn't mean that you are or have to be excluded from God's plan and his command to uh, sh- spread the gospel to the entire world. Because you can be involved by your giving. And there are people who are giving up their career paths. There are people who, uh, in the middle of their lives, in the middle of the career paths, are giving that up and saying, uh, they feel that tug on their heart. And they're saying, I'm going to go into this country that I feel God is leading me to, and I am going to be a missionary to that country. There was a, a missionary couple who came through the Ontario district this past year, and I was looking through their profile, and it was incredible to me because the uh, man of the couple, he was an accountant for the U.S. government, and the woman of the couple was a university professor. Very established careers, very difficult careers to get into. And they said, they felt that tug of of God on their hearts, and they said, we're going to leave it all behind. And we're going to go, and now they are missionaries to the country of Greece. And when we say, leave it all behind, (laughs) we truly mean that. Cars, Houses sold, and they go, and they commit their lives to this country. And we are a part of helping them in all of this because they truly leave everything behind, and they go and they commit themselves. And you, as a church, uh, whether you are part of this church and you didn't know it or whether you were and you did know it, you supported me whenever I was in Stockholm, Sweden. You supported me on a monthly basis, helping me to cover my costs whenever I was in Sweden for three years. And I want to let you know what this money is is going towards. Um, For a while, I actually didn't even live in Stockholm, Sweden. I was like the pastor of the church, but I didn't even live in the city. (laughs) And this is not actually a rare circumstance to be in for a missionary, to live hours and hours away. I lived in a a place called, for a while, for about three or four months, I lived in a place called Fallon, which is a three hour drive away from Stockholm. So that's essentially like pastor living down in Belleville. And every Sunday, pastor would have to drive up here, do services, drive back home, go back to work during the week. That's what I did in in Sweden for about three to four months is take the train down to Stockholm, set up service, do service, go back home during the night, and then work throughout the week. So your Monthly support helped me to pay for the train tickets so that somebody could be there for service, so that somebody could preach. Uh, uh, whenever you are a missionary, I mean, I, I started with just three people, so that means that I was the song leader. Song leader needed to be present. Uh, the usher needed to be present to greet people and, and help them feel comfortable and welcome and, and show them around. Uh, I was also the pastor, so I was preaching that day. Uh, I was also the altar call worker. So, you know, having all of those things and all of those roles to be better in the service, it's important to, to, to be there. So you helped provide train tickets so that I could go there. And, and not only train tickets so that I could be there for service, but train tickets to help other churches around the area. Because, um, for example, in Sweden, there was three of us to cover, there's three ministers and and people who were preaching to cover two different churches. Whenever your country, whenever your country makeup looks like that, you very rarely get a break. (laughs) And you need a break. You need a mental break sometimes. So train tickets to go and help cover uh, other churches and and that kind of thing. Your money helped me pay for my monthly rent. Uh, That was $1,500 per month. That was a friendly discount that I got for that. That was a personal deal. And you know what? I didn't know it at the time whenever I had that apartment, but that monthly rent was more than just for me to have a place to stay in the city. And let me tell you, it's incredibly important for the pastor of a church to be in the same city as a church, because that church is never going to grow, and those people will never get the care that they need without that pastor being present in the city. So I finally did find an apartment and got an apartment in the city of Stockholm. And little did I know that that apartment uh, would also turn into the church building sometimes. 
That apartment, uh, fortunately, was able to fit, you know, 12, 15 people, and we would crowd around that small little living space, and not even everybody fit uh, or had a place to sit, so some people would be sitting on the floor, and I would go, and I'd cram myself into the corner of the room to try and present and give everybody a view and, and, and present and preach to them, and, and that little apartment served as the church's Bible study space. That is uh, very common for a missionary, that their home is also the midweek meeting meeting place for their church. Um, there's actually a funny story that um, for the first about a year and a half that I was in Sweden, we rented out a church location. So we were renting from another church and uh, accidentally actually got us kicked out of that location. <laughs> it happened that one service, we were having a baptism service, which I was very excited about because the first whole entire year that I was there, we only had one baptism. That was our, our statistics for, for that year. One baptism, zero with the Holy Ghost. So <laughs> baptisms were very, very exciting, and they always are, but it, it's something different whenever you only have one in 365 days. So we were having a baptism uh, service that Sunday, and the uh, kind of assistant junior pastor of the church that we were renting from, he was present that day, and I was setting up the baptism tank, and he just came to say hi and, and check in on how I was doing, make sure everything's going well, and I said, yeah, we're all set. He said, oh, you're doing a baptism today. I said, yeah, we're, we're doing a baptism. It's going to be awesome. I was like, you can stick around if you want. You know, doesn't matter to us. Take part. We're having church. You're a pastor. If you want to be a part of it, you know, you're more than welcome, and he said, you know what? Our, our church doesn't believe in baptism, but I've had people come up to me and asked me and say, you know, I, I want to be baptized. And he said to me, you know, whenever I look through the Bible with them and I read it through with them, you know, as a church, we don't believe it, but I can see a reason for it. And I said, yeah, you know, if you want, you can see what a baptism service is like. Stick around. And, uh, you know, if it's informative, if it, if it can help you out. And if you ever want to talk about it, you know, let me know. He said, you know, what? I'd love to meet with you for lunch sometime. And we can talk about baptism. So I said, I, I'm thinking in my mind, wow, God is opening up a conversation here uh, with this young minister. He was, he was very close to my age. So I was very happy to make a connection like that. And, and there I was. I gave him my number and I expected a call that we would meet for lunch and we would talk about baptism. And about a week and a half later after that service, uh, I got another call. And the call said, uh, you are no longer welcome to rent our church facilities. <laughs> so I thought I was having a conversation and progress with this young minister. But uh, most likely what happened is that minister went back and started asking questions. And, and the higher-ups weren't too happy that, that he was speaking to somebody about baptism when they don't believe in it. So that got shut down very quickly, which meant the Stockholm church didn't have a church location. So back to my story about monthly rent. Your monthly rent was the church's monthly rent for a little bit. And the Stockholm church met uh, in that in my apartment. And, and also whenever COVID hit, we didn't have a place. All Everywhere was shut down. So we met in my apartment. So uh, PIM support goes to monthly rent. It goes to subway tickets to go and teach Bible studies. There was a location uh, west of the city of Stockholm where I was doing a Bible study. Somebody else was hosting it in their home because they kind of lived all west of the city. So I was in Central. I would travel all the way about a 50-minute subway ride outside of the city, and we would have a Bible study there. And uh, it, it was an in incredible time because it was a bunch of Jehovah Witnesses who had begun to come into the church, and they were, they were realizing, they were studying the Bible, and they were realizing that what they believed didn't exactly match up with the Bible, and so they, they came to me because they said, you know, we've looked into the Trinity, and the Trinity, it doesn't really make sense, but they got onto uh, some of David Bernard's teachings, and they said, you know, we like what we're hearing here, and, we, and you guys are affiliated with that church, so we want to hear what you have. So I would go, and I would teach them Bible studies about the oneness of God, and it was incredible to see during those Bible studies them, you know, teaching them about the oneness of God, and them seeing it for themselves and, and understanding it, and it was during one of those Bible studies that you purchased the subway ticket for that there was a young man 
from that Jehovah Witness group. His name was Robin. And Robin really wanted to receive the Holy Ghost. They were, they were very uh, much desiring to receive the Holy Ghost. And so I would pray with him during Sunday service. And, and we, we weren't quite having that breakthrough. And there, there just needed to be a little bit more openness there. But uh, Robin, he, he missed a week, and he, and he texted me. He said, man, I just, I'm frustrated. I really want it. And I said, Robin, you're going to get it. You, you want it. You're going to get it. There, there's no problem here. It's just a matter of time. And it was during one of those Bible studies where we were sitting around the living room in a circle, and we were opening up that Bible study in prayer, and I'm sitting next to Robin, and I hear him next to me just speaking in tongues. And I just let him go for a little bit. I, I just love the sound of it. I, I don't want to interrupt this. And Robin was just speaking in tongues in that Bible study. And, and once we closed that opening uh, prayer, I tapped him on the shoulder. I said, Robin, was that your first time doing that? He said, doing, doing what? I said, Robin, that's speaking in tongues. It's, it's unmistakable. I said, did you know what you were saying? No. That's what it is. You're speaking a language that you do not know. That is the Holy Spirit speaking through you. That is speaking in another tongue. He said, oh, my word, Pastor Craig, I've been doing this for about a week now. <laughs> he had no idea he'd been speaking in tongues this whole time. But it was at a Bible study having moments like that where people are speaking in tongues for the first time. People are coming to the revelation of, of the oneness of God. And, of course, uh, PIM monthly support also goes to uh, providing you know, groceries, providing living expenses and, and uh, haircuts and stuff like that. Uh, there's a bunch of different needs that PIMs covers, but I wanted to share those couple of stories with you to understand, you know, it's more than just a subway ticket. It's someone receiving the Holy Ghost. It's more than just a, a, a train ticket. It's somebody coming to the revelation that God is not three gods in one, but he is one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Uh, I know <clears throat> there are, you know, one-time offerings that also get uh, raised up in global missions. These are usually uh, used to either purchase land for a church, to build a church, to build a Bible school, or to build an orphanage. Uh, Brother Ken Cooper from Brazil was here in Ontario this year. He runs an orphanage down in Brazil. Their sister Lynn Jewett, a fellow Canadian, she runs an orphanage down in, I believe it's Guatemala. There is uh, Brother Ron Bryan and his wife who are missionaries to Haiti, and they are uh, unfortunately displaced right now from Haiti because of the gang violence that is happening there, and they were at, at Worldview. They run an orphanage in Haiti, and they were telling uh, unbelievable stories of how they would be driving around Haiti, and because of the gang violence, um, they would be driving through, and there would be a police officer in the middle of the road stopping traffic, but that police officer was not actually a police officer. It was a gang member dressed as, as a police officer, and so he was hiding under that authority. He'd stop it, and then a bunch of people with guns would come out from the side, and they would either just begin shooting, or they would demand that you leave the car. And in this certain instance, Brother uh, Ron Bryan was stopped by these gang members, and they just began firing bullets at the car. And so they duck, and he hits the gas pedal, and they head out, and they could hear those bullets making impacts on the car, and they had uh, some aimers in the back seat, and they ducked down below and they took off and they came back to that orphanage compound that they run in Haiti and he said that Amor got out of the vehicle and he walked around the vehicle for about 30 minutes and he came inside and he said brother Brian there's not one bullet hole in that car how is it possible that they were five feet in front of us and there's not one bullet hole in that car it doesn't make sense but but <clears throat> This is what your money is, is going towards. It's going towards people receiving the Holy Ghost, people uh, being baptized, orphanages being opened up in places where uh, they are desperately needed. We had a missionary from the Philippines talking about how they were taking children off of a place called Trash Mountain, where people were living, kids, children were living off of trash. That's what they were living in. They were taking them out of that, that kind of situation, bringing them into the orphanages, showing them the love and the care of God. And so certainly one way that we can be involved in the mission that God has given us is by giving our money. But there are also more ways to be involved. And you can be directly involved by going. You can go. 
Uh, there are countless opportunities for you to be involved in global missions. In fact, there are probably more opportunities than you realize. And age is not necessarily a factor. Age is not necessarily a factor. You do not have to be a young person to go on the missions field. Um, my mom went on the missions field, and she helped a missionary family with child care. And that was a desperately needed situation. She helped them with child care, and she ran their Sunday school program for several months. And that was a tremendous help to that family because they were going through a time and a season in their life where they had just lost a very close personal uh, family member very tragically. And so they were suffering in, in, in that way. And she went over and she helped them, uh, provided them with child care, helped them run their Sunday school services. There's a bunch of ways that you can be involved. If you are a construction worker, the Ontario men, uh, the Ontario men, they take a trip about every year and they either go and, and they usually are constructing a church. Uh, this Past year, we were, Brother James Church, who's in charge of these trips, was showing us that they went into a country in Africa and built a church there. And I was kind of privy to some personal conversations. They went to Fiji and built a church there. And I was kind of privy to a personal conversation. And he said, if we hadn't went, that church would never have been built. It would have never been built. But it's people who are going and using their talents that they have. You may say, well, well, you know, if you, may, if you look at yourself as a construction worker, it's like, well, how can I be used? You can go and you can build a church for somebody. There are lots of ways to be involved. Uh, I went under the AIM program. The AIM program, you can be there for three months. It's a minimum of three months. And you can continue to extend it uh, as as is necessary for young people, there's a way to get involved in missions. Take your first missions trip in a very safe way. It's called AYC, stands for Apostolic Youth Corps. You can go to apostolicyouthcorps.com. It's for people aged 17 to 30. Uh, Sister Jasmine Abbott went on a trip very recently through the AYC program to the Philippines. And I promise you that all of these trips, whenever you get involved to go and impact somebody else, it is transformational. There is nothing like it. I, I think back to you know, my time in Sweden uh, time and time again because it was a very formative time for me to see the way that God can move, to see him move and operate. And there's just something about helping others. There's something about giving your life for others, which is, what, is exactly what Jesus did for us. So PIMs, monthly support, offerings, all of those things are great. But unfortunately, uh, in our modern world, in our modern era, there's something called a visa that allows you to stay in a country. And those run out. And the only reason I came home during my three-year uh, kind of tenure and dedication to Sweden was because my visa ran out. It's not necessarily because I wanted to. I did want to. You know, you, you miss your family. And missionaries do struggle with isolation and loneliness. They do. Um, but ultimately, you don't want to leave your country. You don't want to leave your church. And there's, there's a variety of situations, one of them, and the most common and the most problematic being that your visa runs out. You're simply not allowed to legally be in that country for you. And it's a terribly difficult time. And I'll tell you, missionaries do not like deputation. Because on deputation, you are in a new city every week. You are living out of hotel rooms. Think about missionaries with young children who are having to homeschool their children, traveling all about, living out of a car, vehicle, or motor home, traveling uh, throughout North America for, uh, you know, it can be a year or even two years, being away from the church that you were making so much progress in, and you began to see progress in. Well, you know, who's covering those services when the missionary is home? A lot of the times, the answer is no one. And all of that progress that was made is now being undone because nobody is present in that country. And for me, I was fortunate enough that somebody else was present in the country to cover those Sunday services. But for me, whenever I was home, uh, because I could not legally be there because my visa ran out, you could find me Wednesday afternoons uh, online teaching a Bible study to the people back in, in Stockholm. It's, missionaries do not like being away from the field. Uh, unfortunately, I can't present to you a solution to get around visas. <laughs> That's just 
countries, governments, that's a problem in itself. But there is a, a wonderful program called I Am Global. I Am Global is an offering that is taken up, and its whole entire mission is to raise money for missionaries in an expedited, in a quicker manner so that missionaries can go back onto the field. And just in 2023, this offering saved 2.2 years of deputation time, sending people back to the field so that they could be present in the churches that they are pastors of. It saved $154,000 in traveling costs. That's gas money. Uh, that is hotel money. That's food. $154,000 that can be spent now in the countries where those missionaries are living. It saved local churches $95,000 in uh, hospitality, ho hosting costs. Whenever we have a missionary come to a church, we've got to pay to put them into a hotel and house them. It saved local churches money. It saved missionaries money. And all of that money can now be spent in the countries where it is most needed. The final thing I kind of want to talk to you about today is this. As in all spiritual situations, this is not unique to global missions by any means. In all spiritual situations, we have uh, seen and experienced it here. When we take territory for God's kingdom, there's always pushback. There is always a retaliation. And I can tell you, even before I arrived in Sweden, there was pushback against my arrival. Uh, I went over there initially with my aunt and uncle, brother and sister Pickard. They were going because they were seriously considering um, being the answer to the, the need that was present in Stockholm. Stockholm didn't have anybody there, and they were going to check out if, if they were going to do it themselves. I went along with them on that trip, and you've heard me. I'm, I'm trying to compress it today, but you've heard me tell this story in length before about how God moved on me there. And I came back, and at Thanksgiving here, my family always comes up here for Thanksgiving, and we spent Thanksgiving here, and I was showing the Abbots, and I was showing the Green, I was showing my family members, you know, pictures of the trip and, and of the church, and I was telling them the story of how God moved on me. And I told them, my plan is that I'm going to go, and I'm going to meet that need. That was the commitment I made. I hadn't purchased a plane ticket. I didn't have a date of arrival. All I had was a commitment. And that's all it took for some spiritual retaliation to take place. Because that night we drove home and as I was sleeping, I could feel my neck and my ear become incredibly hot. And I describe it as otherworldly hot. It heated up and there was a voice that began to speak into my ear. And it began to tell me, Craig, you can't do this, and you won't do this, and you'll never do this. And it was telling me all of these things. And I shot up in my bed, and I sat up, and I just began to praise the name of God. And I said, God, you are good, and I love you. Jesus, you are all powerful. And as, I, as soon as I began to give praise and worship to God, that voice left my ear, and that heat left my neck and my ear immediately. And the power of God began to move in that room. And it was the retaliation of somebody committing and somebody saying, I'm going to go and I'm going to uh, follow the mission that God has placed upon the church and has placed upon my heart. I'm going to go and I'm going to meet that need. I'm going to dedicate my life in expanding the kingdom, expanding God's kingdom here on earth. And there is more to that story. But whenever I finally did get there into Sweden, it was my third day there. And on my third day there, I was walking down a street and, and I looked up the street and I saw a, a large, I'd call it a U-Haul sized truck, a U-Haul sized moving truck coming down the street. And what was weird about that is that it was a pedestrian only street. Uh, vehicles are not allowed, but a, a truck was charging down the street and I could hear screaming and everybody began running and I myself began running, trying to look into a shop to duck into. Remember, this is my third day here. Uh, it's Friday. It's not even Sunday yet. We haven't even had a, a church service yet. I hadn't even been to the church yet, but this truck is barreling down the street. And so I began to look for a place to duck into, but I'm not finding any place to run into. And, and finally, uh, 
I, I look over to my right and I see an alleyway and I say, if I can just take a couple steps over into this alleyway and I look behind me and I can see that truck behind me and I say, it's maybe like seven, 10 meters behind me and it is moving and I can see into that truck and I, I see it and I see the pace that it's moving and I see that it is directly behind me and I accepted in that moment that I was dead. I knew there is no possible way that I can get out of the path of that truck given where it's located, how close it is to me, and how fast it is moving. I completely, 100% accepted that I was dead in that moment. But as I turned to see it, I, I saw an alleyway out to the side. So I just began to curl and to run over towards that alleyway. And that truck barely missed me by about one and a half meters. You can go ahead and show the video there on the screen. I am the person who's going to be circling in a red circle right there there's the truck that is not at full speed that video is not at full speed but you can if you can play it uh, one more time going ahead one two steps into freedom right if we if we take my running stride I'm about a meter I'm about two meters away from the truck as it passes there behind me and I found out through a news report later on that the uh, driver of that truck had a bomb in that vehicle and he had tried to detonate that bomb as he was going down the street but he was unsuccessful in detonating that bomb so not only did I somehow miraculously be missed you see in the video I'm the only person on the street and that day there were people killed and run over by that terrorist vehicle his intention his entire intention was to run people over and blow himself up he did not plan on living but he did you see in that video, I'm the only person on the street. So if his intention was to kill people, why am I alive? Because I'm the easiest target on the road that day. It's the intervention of God. It's the divine hand of God responding to somebody going there and saying, I'm going to do the work of God. I'm going to do the work of God. God was protecting me from the attack of the enemy. The devil tried to wipe me out before I had even had my first Sunday service. We will always experience spiritual attack whenever we go and we carry out God's plan and take territory from the enemy. We experienced it here in this place whenever we built this church. We experienced spiritual attack spiritual opposition it don't it doesn't always come in as you know amazing of circumstances as that we experienced emails we experienced confrontation we experienced spiritual attack here in this place every time we're going to take territory from the enemy he is going to retaliate and he is going to lash out i can tell you right now hamilton church Hamilton, Ontario, they are planning on building the building, and my sister goes there, so I can tell you with 100% certainty, they are going through spiritual attack right now. Missionaries encounter, and they face many spiritual attacks. If you were at uh, family camp this year, Brother Howell, uh, who was there, who was the missions global missions director for many years, he told an incredible story of him coming around and, and terrorists were there waiting for him as he drove along that road and they had big great boulders set up on that road to stop and to kill whoever came by and he said there were people up in the hills with AKs waiting for them and as he came around that, that road and that turn and those boulders were there, he just cried on the name of Jesus and he said that car lifted up from the road and went over the boulders and he continued on down the road God sparing his life God does these things because missionaries are going and we send them into what I will say is a combat zone I'm defining it as a combat zone and missionaries perhaps a little more than other people experience spiritual attack in their lives because they are going into places that have been spiritual strongholds for the enemy for many many years and so missionaries they are facing many spiritual attacks because they are actively attempting and working through the power of God to take away territory from the enemy and so this is an incredible task when we realize that we are going and have to and need to go into places 
Think about countries that are hostile to both not only religion but to Christians. Think about the strongholds of spiritual darkness that exists in our world. Think about the places like Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan that is being ruled by the terrorist organization of the Taliban right now. Think about the forces of spiritual darkness in these places and the people that are being captive there. And so very quickly, I want to talk about Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10, we see some very interesting spiritual insights here. Daniel goes on a fast. He's fasting for three weeks. And at the end of his three-week fast and prayer, Daniel 10 and 12, an angel comes to Daniel on the last day of his fast, and it declares to him, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. We learned something very interesting here. From the first day, from the first day that you prayed, from the first day that you began your fast, I was sent. I was sent to answer your prayer. God immediately, from that first uttered prayer, sent the answer, sent uh, his, his messenger, sent an angel to go and to tell Daniel the answer, to, to interact with Daniel. There was no hesitation. There was no delay in God sending that angel. It was immediately, from the first day, I was sent. But we learn in the next verse that while there was not a delay in God sending the angel to Daniel, there was a delay in the angel arriving to Daniel. Daniel 10, 13, go to the next verse. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. He stood me just about the entirety of the fast and the entirety of your prayer. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I had been left alone with the kings of Persia. For the entirety of Daniel's fast, this angelic messenger that was sent by God from the very moment that he prayed his prayer was held up by the prince of Persia. Who's the prince of Persia? It's certainly not a human. How can we as human intercept and delay and control angels? We can't do it. The prince of Persia is a demon. It is a demonic angel. It is a fallen angel. It is a demon withholding the angel who was sent by God. We see that when Daniel prays and God sends the message, spiritual attack is coming. Spiritual conflict is going. We don't see it. And so it's very easy to forget. But the spiritual realm is very, very active. He says, Michael had to come and assist me for the word to get through. There are places of spiritual wickedness and there are places of spiritual darkness that have been strongholds in this world for a very long time. And around the globe, there are places of spiritual oppression, of spiritual darkness, where people are being held captive, where we as Christians are not legally allowed to go. And God said, it's our mission, it's our duty to go into those places and to overcome the spiritual darkness that exists there. Matthew 16, we'll start with verse 15. Jesus says to his disciples, he says, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answers, and he says, you are Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus responds to him. He says, blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to this to you, Peter, on this rock I will build my church. And what? The gates of Hades will not prevail against it. The gates of hell, the gates of Hades, the gates of Satan's spiritual strongholds will not prevail against the church. Jesus says, Look, you are a witness that I am the Messiah, that I am living, that I will die for your sins, and that I will rise again. The death, the burial, the resurrection it is on this foundation, Peter, and you witnessing it. It is on this foundation that I am building my church. And it is upon that foundation, it is upon that truth, 
that we will overcome the power of darkness and we will overcome the power of Satan. The power of Satan and his kingdom is not able to overcome Jesus. It is not over it is not able to overcome God. It is not able to withhold us or withstand us. My church, the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. The problem is, is that those gates have been holding out God's people and holding in its captives. Things don't change unless we go. Things don't change unless we enter the spiritual war. I already told you that for the first entire year I was there in Sweden, we had one person baptized. And it got to a place where I was frustrated and I was fed up. I said, God, I said to him whenever I went there, look, if it's for one person, however long I'm here, if it's for one person, it's worth it. All of heaven rejoices when one person comes to God. I said, if it's for one person, that's fine. But I'd like it to be more. Because <laughs> I'm fed up. It's been 365 days. And we've had one person baptized. And so I began every single day to spend time doing what I can do in the spiritual realm. And I began to pray. And I had a dedicated time of prayer every single day, fighting against the spiritual forces that were in that city. And it was then that things began to change. Whenever I entered with the power of God into the realm of prayer, it was then that things began to change and, and I began to get calls out of nowhere of people wanting to connect and come to church. Out of nowhere, I don't even know how they got my number. But God began to move into that city. And it, it was then that those Bible studies started to take place. And it was then that baptism started to take place. And our attendance started to grow. It was whenever we go into that place of spiritual warfare and say, God, we're going to overcome these gates. We are going to overcome these gates. This is the mission of the church. This is the command that Jesus has given us to go and to take the territory, to go and to take that land. And so whenever we give to missions, what we are doing is we are funding a spiritual war. It may sound pretty extreme. That's what we're doing. Musicians, if you come back. When I give to missions, I'm funding the opportunity and the ability for someone to go into a place of spiritual darkness and to connect with somebody and to give them a Bible study. Someone who's been seeking God. You would, there's story after story of people going into what we reference as access challenge nations. And whenever they go there, they just connect on the street by God's provision. They connect and they meet and they begin to have a Bible study and they begin to connect and they begin to, to know the word of God and, and, and a breakthrough is made. Whenever somebody goes, whenever we give, I'm funding somebody being baptized in Jesus' name. Whenever I am giving to missions, I, I am pushing back against Satan's kingdom. I am pushing back against those gates, back against those walls. And you, you can go ahead and you can show these missionaries, these missionaries that I'm gonna cycle up on the screen right now. These are the missionaries that we support every single month to go and to take territory for the kingdom. And whenever I am giving to these missionaries, whenever I'm giving to them, I'm funding somebody receiving his Holy Spirit. I'm funding somebody coming to the revelation that he's not a trinity, but he, he's one God. And, I, and I'm fund, funding somebody who's a drug addict, knowing that Jesus loves me and he's, and he's willing to forgive me. And as I, I fund missions and as I give, I'm, I'm funding somebody who's come from a broken child Childhood, knowing that, that God loves them and, and that he cares for them. And, and whenever I, I pray over that foreign church overseas, I'm, I'm sending an angel there to go and give spiritual revelation to the people. Whenever I'm praying over a foreign church, I'm saying, God, would you move on somebody's heart in that country to connect with them? Lord, would you move in that place? Would you move in this country? Would you stand with me here today? What I want you to do during this 
this altar call is I want you to pick somebody that we are showing here. These are people that we give money to every single month to go and to tear down the walls of Satan's kingdom and to build up God's kingdom in that place. And I don't want to focus on our own problems and I don't want to focus on our own situations today. Because there is story after story that whenever we pray for somebody else's need, God begins to move in our own life and he begins to operate in both situations. And I want you to pray over somebody today. God, I pray over the church in France that you would have your hand upon them. God, I pray over these access challenged nations. I pray over the countries of Iraq, of Iran. God, I pray over Afghanistan that has known the rule of the Taliban and terrorism for so long. And God, I pray against the spiritual walls and the spiritual forces that have been present there. Why don't you come around to the altar, pick a family up here and just begin to pray over them. God, I pray over the churches here. Lord, that you would have your hand upon them. I pray over the church, Lord, in Romania today, that your hand would be upon them. I thank you, God, for the Pattersons who are missionaries there and for all that you are doing, Jesus. I lift them up before you today, asking that you would have a breakthrough for that church. Lord, I pray that you would move on the hearts and minds of people in Budapest, Jesus, that your hand would be upon them, that you would lead them to where they need to go. Lord, I pray over the people in Haiti, Jesus, who are there and their missionaries are displaced right now because they are not able to be there because of the violence that is going on in the country. But Jesus, I send your spirit there. I send Jesus, your ministers there, these angelic forces, Lord, I send them right now on your behalf, Jesus, send them to the country of Haiti, Lord. Lord, and move in that place. I pray for Ron and Terry Bryan today, Jesus, that your hand will be upon them and that you would move, I pray, God. I pray over Brazil and the Coopers there. Lord, I pray over that orphanage and those children, Lord, that they would know your love and they would know your truth. Jesus, I pray over these needs today and I bring them before you, Jesus. Oh, shot, I eat, and 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 I